Okay, let's talk about old dogs and new tricks. Um, so what, what, are, what are old dogs? Old dogs are uh, cage rotor induction machines, uh, co commonly referred to as workhorse of industry. And in fact, if you look around the world today, about 90% of the installed motor systems that are one horsepower or higher are a cage rotor induction machine. So I've got a picture here of one that I took apart when I was a grad student. And um, so the, the, the defining feature of this is that the rotor is a squirrel cage. So it's got rotor bars and on the ends of the rotor are rings that the bars are electrically connected to to form this passive circuit. And so I think we're, we're all fairly familiar with the, the concept of, an, of induction motors. And so these are the old dogs. Um, what are the new tricks? Well, the new, the new tricks um, uh, uh, is trying to make it levitate. And I, I, I'm not gonna give you any levitation results today. We haven't levitated it yet, but uh, the, the, this project, um, the, the, this project is, is, is about in, induction machines that are intended to levitate, but it's also just about having fun playing with air gap fields and how the, the cage rotor of an induction machine reacts to air gap fields. And so you don't have to be interested in magnetic, you don't have to be interested in magnetic levitation to uh, appreciate what's going on here. Um, you, you'll see in a little bit, maybe you do have to be into equations and like really dense slides. Uh, apologize for that. I give my students a hard time for having very dense slides and I've, I've filled up a few slides here. So uh, what, what, what's going on here? Why, why am I showing this slide? I wanted to give a, a sense of, of the story arc of this project and how it came to be. Um, because this project has become kind of a, a personal passion for me. It's, it's, it's uh, yeah, one of those problems that we, we, uh, I can't quite let go of that and, and my students have, have humored me and helped me with it and, and uh, led, led the way at, in various efforts on it. Uh, so the project started back in fall of 2018 uh, when, when this, this student here, Jiehao Chen, who was finishing his PhD at Zhejiang University, asked me if he could apply for a scholarship to come visit me and and try to apply uh, some advanced control techniques to uh, the bearingless induction motor and, and using some other innovations that we had. And I, I said, sure, of course. Uh, he seemed like a very motivated and, and, and intelligent student. And, and so he came over. And this, this was a very busy semester for me because this was uh, the first semester that I had a research group. My first year here, I didn't have students. And, and, and so um, all my students were arriving at the same time as Jiao was arriving. So, uh, it was a exciting time, and um, and so he got to work on this kind of on his own, and then we we caught up that winter, and we were going through what he was finding, and and we realized that that what he wanted to do in controls was really just putting a bandaid on a, a a problem that was in the electric machine design, and so um, yeah, you could you you could uh, address the kind of performance issues that you you saw using controls partially. You could solve some um, vector error and torque error issues, but uh, you were going—you were just masking a, an underlying problem, and it was going to reveal itself in really poor efficiency and a, and a bad machine. And so we decided to retool ourselves and um, and target the the design problems. And so we we did this, and that's the story you're about to hear. And um, and so we built a prototype uh, over the summer. And right when the prototype got finished, Jiao had like maybe a week or two to test it. And then his year stay here was over and he had to go home. Uh, but thankfully, uh, the, this student, Yusuke Fuji, uh, was arriving at that point. And, and Yusuke uh, was a PhD student at the time of one of my friends in Japan who had asked if I would be willing to host a student who wanted to, to come do a, a study abroad stay. And I, I, I said, sure. And, and he had an interest in induction machines. So he said he'd do the testing for this. So that was great. Yusuke got started started having some weird problems. And, um, and it turned out that our prototype <laughs> uh, overheated and melted a few things. And so the prototype died right when the pandemic was hitting. And so we, we kind of had to put this project on hold for a while. And then we, we rekindled it this last fall and into the spring. So there's uh, a lengthy explanation of, of uh, the story arc of this. Um, and the, the project, uh, to brag a little bit, has, has been fruitful. Uh, we, we've published uh, we've got four papers either submitted or published so far. Three, these three right here are published. And if you uh, become curious about the work, you're, you're very welcome to, to download them from the WEMPEC uh, 
repository of papers. They're all available. This paper right here is currently under review. And so for that reason, I put confidential on the slides. Uh, so this presentation is confidential until the paper gets published. And then once the paper gets published, it doesn't need to be confidential anymore. Uh, so stay tuned. We hope that the reviewers think it's as fun of a work as, as we do. Um, and, and we've got a patent application filed with, with Wharf on this. OK, so that was the, the light, nice stuff. Now let's fill the screen up with equations and, and make your head spin. Um, Oh, I, I joke. Uh, first, I want to start by reviewing some of the basic principles of, of scroll cage in, induction machines. And um, so if you call the in the induction machine, kind of the defining principles that your rotor rotates at a different speed than the fields in your air gap of your machine. And so we can calculate the, the air gap fields as uh, rotating at a speed of omega divided by our number of pole pairs, where omega is uh, the electric frequency of our stator currents or our stator voltages. And if our rotor is omega r, we can define this quantity called slip, which is, um, which is a per unit quantity that describes how, uh, our, what speed our rotor is spinning relative to our, our stator field. And so we can unroll the air gap of the machine and draw this, this pretty picture over here. Um, here I'm showing, we've got a, 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 a field in the air gap of our machine that's traveling to the right at the speed indicated over here. And um, we've got the rotor speed indicated on, on the bottom. Um, nothing magic about this expression. It's just solving these equations. You get this to be your rotor speed. So when, you're, when your air gap field is, is moving relative to your rotor bars, it will induce a voltage in the bars. Uh, and that voltage will try to create a current. And since you've got this squirrel cage structure where you've got end rings on the top and bottom, you have a path for current to flow. And we can draw out the, the equivalent rotor circuit of a cage winding uh, like this down here. Nothing too magical here. We've got a voltage source for each of those bars. So each of these vertical segments is one of the bars in the cage. Uh, we've got resistances and inductances associated with the bars, associated with the end rings. Uh, so what you'd expect. On, on the right side here, I'm showing a phasor diagram. So this is a diagram of all the voltage phasors and all the bars. And you can see that, that all the voltage phasors are equal magnitude, which again, you expect symmetry and, and, uh, um, and, and their, their spacing is, is equidistant as well. And that spacing depends upon the, the spacing of your bars, as well as the number of pole pairs of your machine field. And, um, and so we're going to build up on this and get this, there we go. So we can take this, this rotor circuit and we're just reviewing EC713 material now. If you want to come learn more about this, you're welcome to, to join EC713. We can transform this into a, 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 similar, a simpler circuit uh, by, by defining an equivalent resistance and inductance that rolls all the end effects into the rotor bars. Uh, and then we can go simpler yet by recognizing that uh, when these voltage phasors are, are equal magnitude and equally spaced, you get an equivalent single phase circuit like this on the right side, which um, has voltages and currents at a frequency of, of S times omega. So, uh, so th this, this transformation of rolling up your end bars and end ring resistances and inductances into, into a single uh, resistance and inductance uh, comes about from the, the terms down here. And, and so this is just Nothing special here. It's just the solution to this circuit. Uh, but there's a few interesting things to notice. One is that uh, we see that we've got this in the denominator, we've got this sine squared times n alpha c by 2. So what, what's going on there? Well, n is the harmonic index of the field that you're doing this for. And so we're, we're interested in talking about and keeping track of all these different harmonic indices or different poles of different fields in our air gap because we're going to talk about bearingless induction motors in a little bit. And in a bearingless motor, you have two fields in your air gap. One field for motor operation, which has uh, P pole pairs, and another field for levitation, which has PS pole pairs. So just keep in mind that we're going to be building up and having multiple harmonics in the air gap of the machine. So here I, I've drawn a situation where we have two harmonics. We've got in red, we've got a two pole field or a one pole pair field. And in blue, we've got a four pole field or a two pole pair field. And, and, and we're showing again the, the speed of each of these fields and we've got our rotor bars. 
And so we can see that the, these resistance and, and inductance values depend upon this value of n, so how many pole pairs a field has, and the bar spacing. And so for some fields, uh, these values will be infinity because sine will be zero. So if the argument of sine is, is, um, is pi or two pi, uh, sine itself is zero, right? And so then we start to see that we can have certain bar spacings that will not link certain harmonics. We're gonna talk more about that soon as well. All right, so, um, so the squirrel cage rotor is, is like a mirror, I'm telling you here. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that when you, when, when you shine a light on a mirror, you get a light reflected back at you, right? So when you, when you shine a field on this rotor, it, it bring, it, it, and, and you move that field, you've got a field in your air gap, your machine, and you start rotating it, the rotor is also going to create, have the same number of pole pairs as the field that you apply to the air gap of your machine. Um, with some caveats. So if, if your bar spacing is certain values, then it won't reflect the field at all. So it'd be like a polarized mirror or something, right? Uh, but in, in this case here, I'm showing an 18 slot rotor exposed to a two pole field. And so as this field moves to the right, there's voltages that are inducing each of these bars. Uh, assuming that, that uh, there's no inductance, uh, you'd get a, a the, the, the current from the bars would create an MMF that looks like what I'm showing you here. If you have inductance, that MMF will be delayed um, angularly in the air gap. So this is what it looks like if you apply a two-pole field to the motor, you get a two-pole field back. Uh, it's got some new harmonics in it, but you know, very recognizable. If you apply a four-pole field to this rotor, you get a four-pole field back. It's got more harmonics in it now, so but it's still recognizable. And if you apply a six-pole uh, field to this, you get a six-pole field back. And now we're seeing that we have pretty significant harmonics. And so we can start to, uh, one, recognize that we, we have this mirror-like property, but also recognize that there are certain values of rotor slots that are preferred, right? Like, or, or numbers of rotor bars. You probably don't really like this design here because look how much harmonics are in the, the field that your rotor produces. This design up here, yeah, that, that looks pretty reasonable. Um, so that's interesting to see. The, the, uh, and, and again, the rotor will reflect the field and add its own new harmonics to it, uh, depending on the bar spacing, the rotor impedance, all, all these things. Okay, so that was a little review of some of the basic principles of, um, of squirrel cage rotors. Now let's talk about the Maxwell stress tensor. Okay, well, we don't really need to go into this. Uh, what is the Maxwell stress tensor? It's a technique or it's a tool rather, uh, to calculate forces and torques on, on, um, from, from fields that pass through a surface. And so I like this tool, and I think that Dan Lewis is going to tell you more about this tool tomorrow. I like this tool because it, it's very general. You can just take a look at your fields that are coming across uh, your air gap, and you can use this then to calculate torques and, and forces that are produced in the rotor. So it's a nice general approach to this. Um, and and, uh, and so here we're showing an example of, this is supposed to be a squirrel cage induction motor. We've got a surface outside of it that we would be integrating our, our fields on to get force and torque. So not going to the math much on this, but talk, using it to get results. So we can, we can use that to calculate torque on a rotor. So here's what the integral would look like. And um, we can reach a conclusion that is hopefully not surprising to many, that uh, you only create torque if you have fields in your air gap that have the same number of harmonics. So if you have, um, if you decompose your radial and tangential fields in the air gap into different harmonic components, so by harmonic, I mean there's a two pole component, a four pole, a six pole component, uh, your two pole component will not interact with your six pole component to create torque. You, you will only create torque between harmonics that have the same um, number of poles. And, and so the opposite is actually true for forces, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, but, but first I wanna comment about this for, um, for torque on, on, on one further slide here. Uh, so so th there's nothing magical about your machine. You're, unlike a permanent magnet motor, which knows that it is a two pole rotor or a four pole rotor, there's nothing magical about the scroll cage rotor that tells the machine it's a two pole machine or a four pole machine. And so what I mean by that is that um, when you try to create torque induction machine, we often show this torque slip curve as this like this dash line here, this kind of smooth curve going up like this. And, and that would be the case if you only had 
uh, a single harmonic in your field. So if you only had the fundamental component. But when you have multiple harmonics, each of those harmonics will have its own torque slip characteristic. And so this diagram is showing the torque slip characteristic for a fifth harmonic and a seventh harmonic. And you can imagine you can you go on so far and so, so forth and, um, and have multiple additional harmonics as well. And so each of these harmonics sums to the harmonic that you want to give you your overall torque slip characteristic. And in this case, you see you got these lots of these local minimum and maximum points. And this you don't like. You don't like this because if your load torque is of a certain value, you'll tend to get stuck at these points, especially in a line fed machine. This can be really a problem. Um, so from the motor perspective, we'd like it if our air gap only contained the fundamental component and nothing else. Um, so that's great. Now, now new trick business. So we're talking about force. Uh, we can similarly use a Maxwell stress sensor to calculate force. And the conclusion we reach with force is that force is only produced by harmonic pairs, which differ in index by one. So what does that mean uh, in English? That means that you need to have, if that, that means that if you have a motor with P-pole pair magnetizing field, so your air gap field has got P-pole pairs, your suspension field that creates forces must have P plus or minus one pole pairs. So if you've got a four pole induction motor to create forces, you must add a two pole field or a six pole field to it. And to illustrate that, I'm, I'm being bad. I'm showing you a permanent magnet machine here instead of an induction machine, but it's a little easier to draw. Uh, and in this case, we've got a four pole rotor. So our magnetizing field has four poles. And in blue, we're adding a suspension field. And you can see that that suspension field is enhancing the air gap field on the right side, weakening it on the left side. And so we end up having a stronger field on the right than on the left. And that disrupts symmetry and creates a force. So in, to create torque, you needed harmonics that have the same index. To create forces, you need harmonics that have different index, indices. And so what this is going to mean for us in the rest of the talk here is that we're going to be thinking about two fields in the air gap of our machine. One field that is our P-pole pair field for making torque, and another field, which is our suspension field, that is going to be plus or minus one pole pairs from that. Both fields are going to be rotating in the air gap. And, and so when we have both of these fields rotating the air gap, they rotate at different speeds. So we already talked about slip relative to the motor field, and that, that's fine. But now you also will have a slip of the rotor relative to the suspension field. And, um, and that slip becomes quite large relative to the rate of slip of your motor field. And so this can, this can lead to and does lead to large currents in the rotor bars that are due to your suspension field. Well, that's not good because those currents will create a field that has the same number of poles as the suspension field and actually start to create torque. Uh, you don't really want torque to be created when you apply a suspension field to your machine. You want to create force independently of torque. Uh, they also will tend to attenuate the force that you can create. Uh, they create large force vector error and they create significant losses. This is not a problem at all at zero speeds, uh, but can be quite problematic as you go to higher and higher speeds. And to talk about that, I, I've got an example here. So in this case, we're talking about a four pole motor with a two pole suspension field. And, um, and so the suspension field's in red, motor field's in blue. Here's our scroll cage rotor. So we can see each of these, these fields is moving to the right. If we think about this for a machine that has a constant slip of 7.5 Hertz, and then we compare uh, the, the, the rotor speed and, and the rotor slip for the suspension field in three different situations. So, so we're keeping slip constant in, in all three scenarios. And then we're changing the electric frequency of our motor uh, voltages between 7.5 Hertz up to 500 Hertz. And then we're gonna calculate the slip frequency that's observed by the rotor relative to the suspension field. So in the first case, we got a slip frequency of 7.5 Hertz. We've got an electric frequency of 7.5 Hertz. So our rotor is stationary and our suspension uh, field has, uh, gives the same rotor slip as the motor field. Okay, that's fine. Now we go up to 500 Hertz though. Now we again have 7.5 Hertz slip relative to the, to the motor field. That means that our rotor is spinning at 14,775 RPM. Uh, and this gives us a huge slip, 253 Hertz of the rotor relative to the suspension uh, field. And that, that's where the problem lies. So those, those currents that will be induced create all these problems. And so the goal, the outcome of this whole talk 
is how to get rid of those currents, how to prevent them from forming and causing all these problems. And um, so here's an eye sort of a slide. We've got a lot of information on here. This is using that same example machine, uh, but presenting FEA study results. And so in, in green up here, I'm showing a plot of the force that is produced on the rotor when the rotor is at standstill. So that was at 7.5 Hertz electric frequency case. And so you can see we're making 125 Hertz, I'm sorry, 125 Newtons. And then on the, um, on the bottom, I'm showing a, a, a trace of when the rotor is spinning at 500 Hertz, or I'm sorry, when the electric frequency is 500 Hertz. And so now you can see that our force is reduced down to eight Newtons. This is the same stator current in both cases. Um, to put it a little differently, for this particular machine, when the rotor was stationary, uh, we were able to levitate or support the rotor's weight with only 2.5% of the stator current being used for force creation. But when the motor was um, operated with a 500 Hertz electric frequency and, and therefore this blue trace, it took 20% of the stator current to support the rotor weight. And so we, I, I mean, I guess it can still behave as a motor, but it's really more of an induction heater at that point, right? It's, it's, um, it's, it's making a lot of heat and, and not, not having very good motor performance. So this is, this is not good. So that's, that's the problem um, or part of the problem. Uh, historically, there, this has been noticed, of course, that this is a problem. And so there have been attempts to solve it. Uh, there's control attempts, which is what uh, Jiahao was initially interested in, but we realized that even if you even if you can create the force vector you want, you're still going to have a lot of rotor bar current, a lot of losses. So um, more interesting is trying to design a machine that won't react to that suspension field. And so that's what we're referring to as a pole specific rotor. It's pole specific because it uh, it it pays attention to the motor poles and does not pay attention to the suspension field. Uh, so there have been attempts at doing this, and they usually look kind of like this. They, they've got uh, a, uh, a squirrel cage rotor that's composed of many different rotor cages that are electrically isolated from each other. Each rotor cage has bar spacing, so that it doesn't link the suspension field. And then you have a bunch of end rings uh, on the axial ends of your rotor to link the individual cages together, but not to each other. So you've got, you've got a bunch of individual electrically isolated cages, all of which have a bar spacing that doesn't link the suspension field. And so that's, that's um, great magnetically. Uh, mechanically, it's terrible because you end up with these really long rotors. So if you, could, if you look at this example here, you can see that the, the axial length of the end connections is like as long, if not longer, than the active length of your stack. And so that, that might be okay in like some very niche application, but most of the time when we think about um, the advantages of magnetic levitation and use cases for induction machines, we're after centrifugal compressor type applications. So blowers, pumps, fans, these kind of things that would all benefit from spinning at, at higher and higher speeds. And when we go to these high speeds, we are limited on the shaft length of our machine because uh, we, we're worried about rotor dynamics. We're, we're trying to avoid critical speeds. So, okay, the bottom line, this, this structure looks great magnetically, but um, it, it doesn't pan out very well mechanically. And so when we were going through these papers, we were, we were realizing that, you know, there, there's all these different, um, there's not all, there's like four or five different papers describing pole specific concepts. None of them are generalized. They're all very specifically focused on, okay, this is a two pole suspension field. Here's, you know, 18 rotor bars. This is how you hook it up. But they, they, none of them were presenting a general investigation of how you design one of these things, what the, what, you know, the theory is behind how the concept works. And so we decided that it would be interesting to take a step back and just um, look at the physics behind how this works and see if we could come up with a way to reduce the, the axial length requirement of the system. And, and so this slide is showing how it works. I've already hinted at that you choose your bar spacing so that you don't link the suspension field. But, but what I'm showing here on this slide is what exactly that looks like. So in, in this case on the left, I've got a rotor circuit uh, for a cage that's pole specific. And this is, this is one cage out of five cages for a 20 slot rotor. So there's, this is one cage that has four bars on it. 
bar one, six, 11, and 16. I've numbered them that way because in between here is a bar two, three, four, five, and a seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, right? But we're only connecting bars one and six, six and 11, and 11 and 16. So we're only connecting bars that are, are five bars apart together. Um, and so when we do that and we unroll our fields like we've got in the middle, you can see that, that the suspension field is in blue and all of these bars see, the, see an identical suspension field um, at any location of the air gap. So at any angle of that suspension field, you're always going to see the same field. And if you draw your star slots phasor diagram for this, you'll see that they have all the phasers aligned in the same direction. I'm not really telling you anything new. This is all implied when we had the calculations of impedance earlier, but I think it's illustrated to see it drawn out like this. So when you have all your suspension phasers pointing in the same direction and you, you look at this circuit, you realize no current can flow, right? All these voltage sources of the same magnitude and the same angle, there's no current. Um, torque, the torque phaser diagram has the phasers spread out, so current will flow. Uh, so that, that's the principle behind this, is that the, the, it's a motor made of multiple cages that you don't like the suspension field. And because the suspension phasers are aligned, they cannot create uh, current. The, one could ask at this point, well, is it possible that you could get all these phasers aligned and have all these phasers aligned? And, and the answer is no, you can't, uh, which is good. And the reason for that is that you're, because that, that PS equals P plus or minus one, because your suspension poles are co-prime with the number of motor poles you have. This, this works out always in this direction. Okay, so that's the principles of how it works. Now, how are we gonna make it shorter? Well, I mentioned to you that, that the pass work has got electrically isolated cages. Well, there, there's no reason for that. So in, in this case, here's our 20, 20 slot rotor. We've got our five cages. Of course, these are be like um, drawn on top of each other, right? But I've just drawn them all separately as electrical circuits. Well, you can, you can connect all these cages together on one end. You can't connect both ends. If you connect both ends, the whole premise is gone. But you can connect one end. Um, and so if you do that, that's nice. Because now, on one, if, if this is one of your individual cages, on one end, you can have a common end ring that, that connects to all cages. So we try to show this in the exploded view here. And the other end, you've got your, um, your, your end ring that connects only bars of an individual cage. So this is an exploded view of what, what that rotor would, would look like. And we're going to splash this figure up a bunch of times in these slides. Um, so that, that's one of the, the interesting things that, that has come out of this work is, OK, you, you can create this neutral point. Um, the other interesting thing is, is, is that we came up with a framework for uh, what combinations of slots and poles you can use to design the rotor. And so the idea is that when, when you design an induction motor, you, you've got these certain preferred number of rotor slots based on your number of poles and your number of stator slots. And so we came up with a way to, um, to be able to use those recommendations to figure out if you can make it a pole specific rotor and then are able to use that to draw some kind of subtle insights into whether it's a good combination of, of slots and poles. And that, that, that's in this paper. I don't want to get into that too much in this talk. Uh, but but the, big, the big conclusion here is in green, and maybe this is obvious as well. Everything's obvious in, in hindsight. Uh, more suspension poles yields more bars within an individual cage. And that means that you have fewer number of cages, which means that you have less end rings. So if you have an equal number of slots across multiple different numbers of suspension poles, you'd always prefer to have the higher pole combination because then you can divide those slots up amongst, um, you can have more slots per cage, right? So, so basically another way to say the requirement of a pole specific rotor is that you're going to co electrically connect bars in parallel that span a suspension pole pair. So if you have two suspension pole pairs, you can have two bars, right? If you have three suspension pole pairs, you can have three bars because you have a whole pole pair of the suspension field occurring between these bars. Four suspension pole pairs, even better. Now you get four bars per cage. Um, and, and so uh, the, up until uh, when we took a look at the literature, the only values of suspension field that had been considered were, were uh, two pole machines and four pole machines. And so this work here that we've done, we, we have thought about this up to four pole pairs. You could go even higher, but then your <laughs> the number of motor poles you have starts to get a little ridiculous and you've got low magnetizing inductance and, and other problems. But we think it's, it's feasible to go up to four pole pairs or eight poles of suspension field. Okay, so a few more review heavy theory slides and we get to some more um, fun light stuff. Uh, the equivalent circuit of an induction machine. So as you may recall, it looks like this. 
Uh, we, we can derive this circuit here from, from insights into the machine design, leakage inductance, data resistance, um, iron loss, magnetizing inductance. And, and it's got this, uh, this current source in it, which, is, which is, comes about from equating the MMF on the, the air gap MMF. Uh, learn about this in 713. And, and then we've got this rotor equivalent circuit that we derived before. And so if you notice that you've got these two sources that are, are codependent upon each other, it looks kind of like a transformer, right? This is a transformer analogy of, of induction motors. And so you can, you can combine these to form the conventional equivalent circuit. And, um, and so indeed, we, we talk about a turns ratio that's transforming our rotor quantities into these primed quantities here that, that, that are rotor coins observed or seen by the stator. So that's, that's nice. It's a super powerful tool for both induction machine design and, and analysis. And, and so we looked at how you can extend this to the pole specific rotor, which has multiple cages. And not surprisingly, you, you can, you get this exact structure out. Um, along the way, you see each cage appearing as a parallel current source uh, with, in your stator circuit that, that you eventually bring over. And, and when you do all this, um, you again find the same turns ratio as you found for a squirrel cage rotor. So if you have a pole specific rotor with the same number of total rotor bars as your squirrel cage rotor, you'll have the same turns ratio. And so it looks, it looks great, uh, but there's a, there's a little bit of a gotcha there, which is that your values of LR sigma and RR, your, your actual rotor leakage inductance and resistance are different for the pole specific rotor because that rotor bar spacing was different. Because remember, we had that pesky one over sine squared n alpha c in the denominator a few slides back. And so there's, there's a little nuance here. And, and this means that you're going to get different harmonic currents in the rotor. And therefore, some of the guidelines that we follow for um, induction motor design, number of rotor slots might be a bit different. Uh, we show in our paper that for significant power machines where you're, you have significant length, uh, it's, it's like unlikely to be any difference of significance. So anyway, the takeaway is that we can use a standard circuit to model the pole specific induction machine, as long as we update our parameters. And, um, and so let's summarize the, the theory portion of this talk. What, what have we learned here? What, what, what have we done? Well, we've got new slot pole combinations for creating pole specific rotors. We, we know how to test any slot pole combination to see if we can create a pole specific rotor and we know how to figure out how many end connections it's going to require. So that's, that's nice, that's great. Uh, we've got some new ways to reduce axial length. We can use this common end ring. Uh, we can use more suspension poles so that bars can appear, more bars can appear in parallel within a cage. And, um, and we found out that we can use the same equivalent circuit, uh, although the, the parameters of the circuit will differ a bit. Okay, so that was the, the heavy, um, most of the heavy eyesore plots. Now let's talk about uh, testing and experimentation. So we built a prototype. Here's, here's a picture of our first prototype. It's got a cute little machine. It's got uh, um, two suspension poles. I, I'm sorry, two motor poles, uh, four suspension poles, 16 slots. It's rated for 30,000 RPM, though we, we certainly have not tested it that, and I, I would be afraid to. We've not done any structural analysis on it, uh, but we use that to size the, the tip speed or the, the diameter of our rotor. Uh, it has a rated slip of 12 and a half hertz. And, and in these conditions, that corresponds to a slip from the, the suspension field perspective of 475 hertz. So again, very high slip when you get to rated conditions and can create 1.2 newton meters of torque. So here's uh, Martin and, and Jehao building this. And I, I can't see my background, but uh, you can see Martin in the background, I think behind me, uh, testing this machine on the mill. And you'll notice that um, in, in time units of, of Martin hair length, uh, this has been a little while. This is summer, summer 2019, and, um, and I, I, Mar Martin's a good sport. I'm, I'm giving a hard time, but he, he, he's got pandemic hair now that wasn't there before. So, um, so we did some initial testing in, in early 2020 with, with Yusuke, and um, that was pre-pandemic. Things weren't working. It turns out that oh, well, we had overheated that rotor, and these these end rings had kind of settled down on top of each other to effectively make our pole specific rotor be a squirrel cage rotor. So we thought we made a pole specific rotor. Uh, we not so much, and so um, and so we had to wait till the pandemic was easing a bit, and we could be able to get lab access. And uh, and Anson, an undergrad working with us, and and Martin. 
uh, were gracious enough to go rebuild the rotor. And so here's a picture of them having some fun in the Wempec labs, uh, the jeweler's torch, building the new structure. And we got a little bit uh, more clever when we built the new structure. So uh, this, this picture here is actually, is actually the old rotor before we damaged it. The new rotor uh, has all the bars being the same length so that we can install a second end ring onto it and turn it into a squirrel cage rotor deliberately. And why do we want to do this? Well, we want to do this because we're trying to compare the performance between the two structures. We want to do an apples to apples comparison. What, what do we gain by making this pole specific structure? And so here's the rotor with that, the second end ring installed. First, we test it like this. Then we install the second end ring. And then we realize, oops, we didn't do enough tests. So we had to take the end ring off and do more testing like this, uh, such as the story of, of uh, experimental work. So um, here's, our, here's our testing approach. There, there's the three of us in the lab uh, earlier this spring. Um, we, we constructed a contact-free dynamometer with some help from Kyle uh, using a five-axis CNC mill. And so the, the, the premise here is that we, we bolted a six-axis load cell from, from HBK onto the XY table of the mill. And on top of the load cell, the, uh, the stator is, is bolted. And, and then the rotor is secured in the spindle of the mill. And so the rotor is, is totally contact free from the stator. And because of this, we're able to measure reaction forces and torque using our load cell. So we can flow all kinds of current in there. We can measure the forces and torque that appear in the load cell. And those are the reaction forces produced in the stator um, when, when, it's, when it's creating force in the rotor. So that, that's great. That's gonna be the basis of a lot of the results I'm about to show you. Uh, and we, we also did a series of tests where we put a Rogowski coil on one of the rotor bars that we can measure the rotor currents directly. And, um, and yeah, so that's the test setup. Uh, one more thing you need to know is that we have a special winding in here uh, called a combined winding. And I can talk your ears off someday about combined windings, but today is not the day. Uh, what is a combined winding? Well, a combined winding is a special stator winding that's able to produce two different fields in the air gap. So it, it basically uses the same coils to create the suspension field and the motor field. And, um, and so this is nice because it, it, it helps us do an apples to apples comparison. It gives us a benchmark for how much current to be flowing. We can say that, hey, this test was run with rated coil current from the motor perspective and from the suspension perspective. Um, and, and, and just quickly, what's going on here is that we've got on, on the top here, we've got a motor inverter that attaches to our machine. We got a physical neutral point. So when you flow a current from the motor inverter, it will go to this physical neutral point. This machine is, is kind of special because over here, you see another set of terminals that go to the suspension inverter. Well, if we, if we took the suspension inverter out and we could short these terminals together and we'd have a two neutral point system. So this motor inverter does not need to know that there's a suspension inverter here. It, the current comes in, splits both ways. And, um, and it's like it's a motor with two neutral points kind of a standard thing. But instead of doing that, we open this neutral point up and we apply new currents that take this path here. So currents that come from the motor inverter create the motor field. Currents that come from the suspension inverter and flow to the physical neutral point create the suspension field. And so we're gonna be showing tests where we're exciting the currents from both of these terminals. And so you don't need to worry about the details of that. All you need to think about is the fact that we're able to apply currents that create motor field and currents that create suspension field. And so you'd expect that we would see an equivalent circuit of the machine when looking in the motor terminals and the suspension inverter is short circuited or looking in the suspension terminals and the motor inverter is open circuited. And that is what we're going to be exploring. So first, do we get rid of the rotor bar currents? So here's a test result uh, from the squirrel cage rotor. And uh, in red is the current that we're injecting into the terminals in the machine. And then in blue is the current that we're measuring with our Rogowski probe. And so you can see that we see a pretty significant rotor bar current, uh, 50 amps per division. We're, we're exciting the machine from the suspension terminal. So this is, a, this, is, this is current in the rotor bars resulting from the suspension field. And, um, and so that's the current we're trying to eliminate. And if you look here, now here's a test result for when we don't have that end plate on. And you can see that we have successfully significantly minimized it. Well, how good of a job is this? Uh, turns out it's about a 91% reduction of currents. 
uh, we go from 60 amps RMS down to, to 4.9 amp RMS. And, and you can compare this against how much current is in the rotor bars when we've got motor excitation. And you can see that this is quite enormous um, reduction. You can also look at how our rotor bar current behaves relative to slip frequency and, and see that it, you know, we reach kind of a plateau when we get out here, but the, the pole specific rotor never gets to much rotor bar current. Uh, so that's great. We minimize that current. Now, what about the rest of the performance aspects of the machine? How, how are we doing on torque, force, and equivalent circuit parameters? So in terms of measuring torque slip, when we, when we excite the machine from the motor terminals, we can measure kind of the typical torque slip curve that you, you expect to see. Uh, for both rotors, we get a totally identical torque slip curve. So that's, that's great. That's what we want to see. Uh, we did not degrade our motor performance by making it be a pole-specific rotor. Uh, this peak right here is the 12 and a half hertz that we list as rated as rated slip. On the right side, now you can see um, uh, the, our attempts to measure a torque slip curve when exciting the machine from the suspension terminals. So interestingly, the squirrel cage motor does exhibit a torque slip curve, uh, pretty, pretty noticeable torque slip curve. The pole specific rotor does not, and that's what we're looking for. We get no distinguishable torque slip curve from this, from this rotor. How about forces, force attenuation? So here we're measuring the, the force produced in the rotor um, against different slip frequencies. And we can see that as we increase slip, the squirrel cage rotor is steadily decreasing. However, the pole specific rotor holds constant. This is exactly what we wanna see. At 50 Hertz slip, our squirrel cage rotor has about a 40% attenuation. So that is, that's pretty significant considering the fact that the rated suspension slip is 475 Hertz. Um, and, and the pulse specific rotor does not have any noticeable attenuation. Uh, we can similarly do a test for losses and, and we have a similar story that we've reduced the losses in the machine quite, quite substantially. So what, what I think really uh, kind of hits at home in a, in a satisfying way from the theory perspective is to look at measuring the equivalent circuit of the machine from, from both the, the motor terminals and from the suspension terminals. And so we did this using the classical uh, blocked rotor and synchronous rotor test. And the idea is that, that um, in the synchronous rotor test, we use the, the mill spindle to drive the rotor at the same speed as the field that's rotating the air gap. Um, and then we have zero slip, right? So if you look at this equivalent circuit, you plug zero in for S, this branch right here is infinite impedance. You wouldn't expect to see it if you measure your input impedance. Uh, and then we repeat the test, but now we hold the rotor at zero speed using the mill spindle. And now this branch does appear because S equals one. And so we measure the input impedance in both cases and then we use that to solve the, these parameters. Um, and so on the top here, we're, we're doing this for the motor terminals of both rotors. And yeah, you can see we're measuring pretty similar um, parameters within, within a reasonable accuracy for the equipment we were using. Um, but quite interestingly, now from the suspension terminals, the squirrel cage rotor is this, is this row here. And you can see that we're getting different impedances when we look in the, the input side, the different input impedances. And we can, we can use this to calculate out our, our effective resistances and inductances. So we see an equivalent circuit, but the pole specific rotor, we cannot, we have no, uh, no significant difference in the input impedance. So the pole specific rotor shows the same input impedance from the synchronous rotor test as the blocked rotor test. That means that this, this branch here does not exist even in the blocked rotor test. And so we can't actually calculate out these resistances and inductances. Um, so I thought that was, that was very nice and satisfying to see that, that we, can, um, we can see this even at the equivalent circuit level that this, this structure is behaving this way, which, which you'd expect from the theory. Uh, the last thing I wanna highlight just briefly is that we, we took this uh, and we wanted to know how good of a job we could do in designing a machine uh, with one of these rotors. And so we went to, we, in, in a work I'm not gonna talk about now, we developed an optimization framework that, that optimizes machines based on efficiency, torque rotor volume and, and force vector error. And, um, and we, we tried out seven different slot pull combinations from two motor poles up to six, four suspension poles up to eight, different rotor slots following the, the best practices. And we did this for, for an industrial compressor system uh, of 100 kilowatt and 3000 RPM but we assume two motor segments sandwiching the axial bearing. So each, each motor segment is 50 kilowatt. So a lot of facts come at you fast. Um, but but the, the bottom line, the punchline here is that when we, when we create a plot that shows 
all of the designs that we evaluated in terms of these uh, uh, metrics, we can see that efficiencies on the y-axis, we can see that we get a lot of designs that are over 95% efficient. Uh, this is you know, a 2D FEA uh, uh, with, with some windage loss modeling. It's not an experimental result. So of course, we don't know definitively how well we can do, but, but this starts to make it seem interesting to explore this concept further. We, we took uh, our favorite design of this and we created some 3D renderings, which you can see. So this is a 50 kilowatt, 3000 RPM design. You can see it's got about five inches of axial length. It's got um, three and three quarter inches of diameter. So it's a pretty compact uh, little nugget. And, and we see that the increase in axial length for the suspension, I, I'm sorry, for the, the rotor enterings is, um, is very minimal, only about a 15% increase as compared to the, um, the length that would be required if there's a scroll cage rotor, which is just the, the lamination region. Um, and this, this length would probably fit underneath the end windings of the stator, so it probably doesn't actually add any length onto the machine. So that's, that was nice to see. Uh, in conclusion, we were able to observe experimentally about a 91% a, a reduction in rotor bar current, and this eliminates uh, force attenuation, suspension losses, at the same time, we really get the same motor performance. So these are, these are good things. And we're, we were able to show that we can, we can get a minimal increase in the axial length of the machine. Um, a big open question is how practical this is to actually build. Can you do, can you do it low cost? Um, I mean, maybe you can take advantage of some of these new additive manufacturing techniques Professor Brulette is telling us about. Uh, and, and so we did an FEA study that shows the promise of this. We think that this justifies future investment in bringing this induction motors for significant power applications. And um, in this plot here on the right, I'm showing a, a, a plot of all published test results so far of bearingless motors, their efficiency versus their power rating. So there's not a lot of test results that give you both efficiency, experimentally measured efficiency and power rating, but those that, that do are, are presented here. And we think that the area opportunity is, is in this green box right here. So this, this, this curve shows IE4 efficiency standard. You can see that existing machine designs, whether they're brainless induction or surface permanent magnet or whatever, are not currently very efficient. But our, our modeling and our testing so far shows that, that it's very possible to hit these targets. And this is where we think that the future is for this technology. OK, so that's what I got. Um, I, I hope you all come and, and chat with me in, in the WEMPEC video game. I, we, all the faculty have booths. So here you can see me hanging out with my friends. We've got uh, Dan and Tom and, and our student Michael and Pia are hanging out, chatting up. Uh, so when you walk around, this is, what, this is what it looks like. And you can come and, and, and track us down. And, and here's a, a view of what it looks like to look at a poster. OK, with that said, um, we'll open up for a couple of questions. And I need to figure out how to get my view so I can see Zoom just a second. All right, do we have any questions? So Kyle, I don't, I don't know, but I can't see the Q&A panel, it turns out, while I share my screen. Yeah, I don't see any questions yet. OK. Oh, here we do. Here we have one. Uh, I can just read it off. Sure. Uh, does the slot shape uh, does slot shape affect rotor currents? Yeah, it, it does, um, but but it does it it can't really be used to get rid of these rotor currents from the suspension field. But it it certainly it certainly has an impact. We we in um, in one, in one, the paper that's published, we actually did a comparison of a couple different slot shapes on on the performance of the bearingless motor, and um, and found that. Uh, a, a drop shape bar gave a little better performance. The round shape bar seemed a little easier to manufacture. So there is some impact, but it, it's more in the order of like a second order fine tuning, just how great your design can be as opposed to solving the root problem of, of these suspension currents. Okay, I have, here's another question. All right, is there a reason the rotor bars were not skewed? Would it affect the suspension force? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
So if you skew your rotor bars, you start to create uh, an axial force component in addition to a purely radial force component. And, uh, and so that, that, is, that opens up a new, uh, a, teaching old dogs new tricks, so a new can of worms that, that needs to be solved. Uh, we, we're able to, with the slot pull combinations that we picked, get acceptable torque ripple without using any skew. And so for this study, we did that. But that, that's a very good question. And, and yes, you have this problem. One, one of the tricks to solving it is that if you do this twin bearing this motor configuration that I, I was showing up here, where you've got um, two, two bearing this motors sandwiching an axial bearing, and you skew in opposite directions of each of your bearing this motors, the, the axial force will cancel out. Okay, I got one more. Uh, what is the advantage of this design over PM? rotor bearingless machines. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's some, there's some, uh, there's pros and cons, I would say to both. Uh, the, the induction motor tends to favor a smaller air gap, which is advantageous for creating forces. So you end up needing much less suspension MMF to create an equivalent amount of force for an induction machine versus a, a permanent magnet machine if you solve the rotor current issue. Uh, so the, the permanent magnet machine, uh, I, I guess let me back up a, a step here. In, in most bearingless motors, your force is predominantly created by Maxwell forces, which are like a reluctance force. You have to have a field cross the air gap. So larger air gap really uh, has an attenuating effect on the amount of force you can create. Permanent magnets appear as an effective air gap to, a, to an MMF. And so, um, and so if you have a really thick permanent magnet machine, you're going to need a lot of MMF from your stator winding in order to create a meaningful force. Whereas induction machine, you can get by with less. Now, the permanent magnet machine has, has other advantages, right? It doesn't have this rotor current issue. So that's, that's a pretty nice advantage. Um, it, it also, uh, it, you know, you get this flux for free almost, right? So you're, you're not worried about, you kind of have a, a bit more inherent decoupling between motor and suspension operation in the, in the, the bearingless induction machine when you got to regulate that rotor flux uh, to keep it constant if you want to keep your, your suspension decoupled. 